Uh, I'm Melissa Muscatine. I'm one of the co-owners of Politics and Prose along with my husband, Brad Graham. Um, and on behalf of our fabulous staff, we welcome you all to uh, this afternoon's event with Mark Mazzetti, who has just uh, published a, a really extraordinary new book. It's called The Way of the Knife, The CIA, A Secret Army, and a War at the Ends of the Earth. Um, I also want to just say that in addition to Mark, we have his, his wife, Lindsay, and his dad, Joe. Thank you for coming. It's nice to have you both. Um, Mark covers national security for the New York Times. And um, as you probably can imagine, that means he has to go to some rather dangerous and far-flung places. He's reported from Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Horn of Africa and Iraq. Uh, and if you count presidential political campaigns in this country as dangerous and far-flung, he's, he's also done that, too. I actually was joking to him earlier about whether his wife or his dad or any of his friends and relatives have taken his passport away from him so that he can't go back to any of these places anymore. Uh, his reporting has been quite, uh, quite tremendous. He's won, won a Pulitzer Prize in 2009 for his coverage in Afghanistan and Pakistan. He's been a Pulitzer finalist another time. He's won a Polk Award and a Livingston Award. And for those of you who don't know what the Livingston is, it's quite prestigious. It's given to, I think it's reporters under 35. Is that right? Um, so I did a little bit math, because I was counting up all these incredible awards. And I just have to say, he's not even 40 if I did my math right yet. So. Almost 39. Okay, so that's pretty good. That's a pretty good record already. Um, you know, you also are probably aware, especially if you come by here uh, on a regular basis, that there are many, many good and compelling books about uh, our nation's role in the world right now, the wars we've been engaged in over the past couple of decades. And so you might uh, be asking yourself, what makes this book so special? Uh, Mark is one of the first reporters to explain in detail how the new global ge geopolitical landscape is changing the way the United States does its business overseas, specifically how an American military and intelligence structure designed to deal with official governments and rules of conflict has radically changed its own rules to meet the threat of new enemies, specifically non-state actors and their loose affiliates who operate across mountains and oceans and borders. Uh, and I think uh, this book raises a lot of really uh, important questions. What happens to our national security when the Central Intelligence Agency becomes an agency for manhunting rather than traditional spycraft? Or when the Defense Department focuses increasing attention on collecting information rather than sticking just to military operations? As Mark demonstrates so compellingly in The Way of the Knife, the questions go beyond the CIA's use of unmanned drones or our military's reliance on outside contractors or the strange bedfellows we've made in our pursuit of Islamic jihadists. At the heart of this book are fundamental questions about what really constitutes na national security and whether, in employing the way of the knife, we are indeed doing a better job of protecting our country and our values. It's a remarkable book. He's a remarkable reporter. Please buy it, please read it, and please join me in welcoming Mark Mazzetti to Politics and Growth. Thank you so much, uh, Lissa, and um, thank you for all for coming on a very nice Sunday afternoon. And um, as nerve-wracking as Pakistan is, it's not as nerve-wracking as being at Politics and Prose, um, <laughs> where um, you uh, is a very discerning audience and where everyone really knows knows their stuff. So it's a tremendous honor to be here and um, and to be asked to to speak. I, um, Brad Graham, and I uh, go go back a bit. Um, we I, I started covering the. Defense Department for U.S. News and World Report in the spring of 2001, and um, it was about six months before 9/11. And um, I, and my editor, came to me and said, "Do you want to cover the military?" And I said, "I know nothing about the military or defense." And his response was, "Well, there's really nothing happening, so you'll be fine." <laughs> and then, um, and then 9/11 happened, of course. And in the year afterwards, it was this hum very humbling experience, uh, competing against the likes of Brad Graham. Um, my now colleagues, Tom Shanker, Eric Schmidt, Michael Gordon, um, and um, this trial by fire on the beat. And, um, and it's, it was sort of learning from some of the masters in the hard way, uh, getting beaten on stories. But, um, but um, you do, over time, learn how this, how this world works and um, begin, you feel like you begin to, to hold your own. Um, and then Brad's great book on, um, on Rumsfeld was very helpful for my own um, book that... that um, that sort of track some of these developments since 9-11. Um, so again, it's great to be here, and, and thank you for coming. Um, this book is, uh, it's at it, its essence, it's a book about a secret war. Uh, it's a war that's been, that's still ongoing. Um, it doesn't show any, at least outward signs, of slowing down. 
and it's a war that has um, created this new model for how the United States goes about uh, the, the business of war. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, as much as possible what I've tried to do is tell a history of the wars uh, outside of the big wars. So since 9-11, we've come to know basically what has happened in Iraq and what has happened in Afghanistan, but I think that the contours of um, these secret wars in Pakistan and in Yemen, in parts of Africa, um, to still very much um, are unknown to people. Uh, they're unknown not only to the American public, in many ways they're unknown even to Congress. And we're just now, I think, getting a sense of, of what has happened. And, and, and what my hope was in this book is to, is to tell a story about um, a narrative of, of what has happened and, and who has been um, at the center of this, um, what the implications are, and, and how it sort of fundamentally changed things um, for, for a long time to come. I've, um, I, I've done some traveling uh, for the book. As Lisa mentioned, I, I was in uh, Pakistan most recently um, last summer. And because my hope was to write a book that was not just a Washington book, a book about um, meetings that happened, what happened behind closed doors. There is a fair amount of that in the book, but it was also to tell a story of uh, what, uh, what the impact of these secret wars are um, on uh, American relationships, on humans, on people uh, in these countries where the war is waged. Uh, and again, the impact on um, some significant institutions uh, here in, in Washington. Uh, one of the big themes that I, I get at in the book is, um, is this sort of gradual convergence um, and blurring of the lines between the work of soldiers and the work of spies and how um, traditional intelligence work has changed and military work has changed in part because you've had uh, this intense focus on manhunting and killing um, since September 11th. And I wanted to just go through that just a little bit um, today to, just, to talk about what I, what I mean. Um, a lot of the book is, is about um, the, the CIA as an institution and its sort of uneasy relationship with um, operations and, and, and lethal action. Um, there's though anyone who knows some about CIA history, and I imagine a lot of people in this audience do, um, know that the CIA has had um, its work has sort of gone it's been cyclical, and um, there's there's these cycles of intense operations, uh, and then uh, revelations about those operations and recriminations about what happened, and uh, then a period of retrenchment where the CIA stops doing it because they get publicly beat up for doing it, and then something happens overseas or in the United States like 9/11, and there's a accusation of being risk averse and then the cycle all starts over again and they go down the road that many felt that they shouldn't have in the beginning. Um, so the, um, the, the, the period after 9-11, the, the week after 9-11 actually, President Bush authorized the CIA to have this really global mandate um, to go around the world to capture and kill. Uh, and it was a lethal authority that the agency hadn't had really for decades in the sense of, um, of, being, of, of, of going out and, and, and doing um, manhunting and, and, even, and even killing. Those of you who remember the church committee investigations of the mid-70s remember that um, there was all sorts of um, discussion of uh, coup attempts, assassination plots. There's the famous picture of, of um, Senator Frank Church holding up a poison dart gun that the CIA had built to kill a foreign leader, and I actually have that in the book. Um, and it became the sort of enduring image of the CIA's early days. Um, and then there was a generation of CIA officers who came in after church, and who I sort of try to track in the book of what, what, it, what it meant to be a CIA officer after the church committee investigations, where um, although we certainly know about uh, some of the secret wars in the Reagan administration in Latin America and Afghanistan, um, basically there was this push to get the CIA back to traditional spying espionage um, and a generation of officers were basically taught the CIA doesn't go out and kill people. Um, and so then 9-11 happens and um, there is this very broad order. And as I, as I write about in the book, um, it's it sort of what happens in the CIA operations uh, in the wake of 9-11 is there's, there's a, a couple different different distinct stages. There's um, the stage in the beginning in the first couple of years where the really focus is capturing and interrogation and people uh, probably don't need to be told um, sort of basically what happened in 
um, in the, the sort of CIA's efforts after 9-11. There were secret prisons. There were very controversial interrogation techniques like waterboarding. And you had, again, this period where the, the, it is revealed what happens, and there's this sort of intense spotlight on CIA operations. At that time, uh, up to that point, until about 2004, there had been very, very few uh, targeted killing operations with armed drones. Uh, there had been a handful. And um, there had been actually only, there had been some in Afghanistan, but in terms of outside of war zones, there had been one in Yemen in 2002. Um, and that's about it. So in May of 2004, there is a uh, CIA inspector general report that's completed, it had been a long time in the, in the works, by a name, man named John Helgerson, um, which detailed a lot of the abuses that had taken place in the prisons. And this was a big moment in the agency where, um, and the Bush administration more broadly, where uh, the, the report sort of raised questions of criminal activity, possibly um, war crimes that, that the CIA interrogators, some who would, the CIA, many of the um, interrogation methods had been approved by the Justice Department, but there was also a sort of period of, of fr there was freelancing as well, and there was some very um, hair-raising abuses that were detailed in this report. And not to draw too direct a line uh, from the work of capturing and killing, but one month after the Helgerson report, um, you have the first CIA drone strike in Pakistan. And I raise that only because it's an important moment where the CIA, inside the CIA, is, there is this concern about the fallout, the impact of the interrogation program. And a month later, in June 2004, the CIA carries out its first drone strike in Pakistan, killing a, a, a militant named Nek Mohammed. And there's a, a steady trickle of, of drone strikes afterwards. Uh, uh, but then, in starting around 2008, at the end of the Bush administration and continuing into the Obama administration, you see literally hundreds of drone strikes. And in many ways, that has become what the public has, knows the CIA to do now. So people who are younger, who don't remember the, the Church Committee and, and, and the wake of the Church Committee, now many think, well, the CIA goes out, hunts, and kills, and kills people with drones. Um, so that is not, obviously, that is a, that is an, a simplification, but so much of the agency is now focused on manhunting um, and killing that it has raised questions about what is lost. What are the opportunity costs of, um, of, of being so intensely focused on these kinds of operations? And one thing that I, I raise in the book is, um, is this is one example of, of where the CIA maybe um, had, had missed something um, was the Arab Spring. In the beginning of 2009, you have this series of revolutions taking place in Tunisia, in Egypt, um, in Libya, in Yemen. And uh, there was this feeling in the White House that uh, the agency was a little bit, was behind the curve. And um, not that they should have predicted the spark that set off the Tunisian revolt, but at that time, as these, as these revolutions were playing out, the agency was not able to get uh, up-to-date information to the White House to sort of give context and give a sense of what is, um, uh, what's next. And that's really what the CIA at its basis is supposed to be doing, is be looking behind corners, basically looking into the future and, and sort of getting a shape of global events. And so one problem that I raise, one issue, and it's, and it's, it's an issue that, you know, again, there's opportunity, if you're doing one thing, you can't be doing something else. When the CIA is so intensely focused on manhunting, uh, they are necessarily going to be working very closely with the spy services of Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, um, Libya. And um, because those spy services will help you hunt uh, and capture or kill uh, people in those countries. But those are the last people who are also going to tell you, by the way, there's a revolution around the corner and our regime's about to go under. Um, and that is, so when you're working so closely with these, these of foreign spy services, you're not you're probably not having enough on the ground intelligence, working with dissident groups, understanding uh, the fragility of the regime, and so this is one of the issues of with the militarization of the CIA, um, you have um, less focus on this sort of pure espionage work, pure intelligence gathering. Um, I want to talk a bit a bit about um, the, um, the sort of on the other side of the coin, which is the, the Pentagon, um, the sort of ch ch changing nature of the military, uh, the. CIA is given this mission, as I said, right after 9-11, uh, basically put in charge of, the, of these secret wars. And the, uh, over at the Pentagon, 
this just infuriates the new defense secretary, Donald Rumsfeld. And in Brad's book, he really expertly sort of gets a sense of what, um, what sort of Rumsfeld's view of this new war uh, going on uh, was. And he is, uh, he sees Afghanistan, he gets Afghanistan as, okay, we can get people in there and unseat the Taliban. But what he really wanted to do was to send people all over the globe because he said, this is a global war. We are, in a, we are the military. We are the Department of Defense. Um, we should be running this. And uh, how do I do that? The problem was that he thought he didn't have the authorities to do it. He couldn't just send soldiers into places like Indonesia, um, the, you know, the Philippines, Yemen, Pakistan, because um, the military operates in traditional war zones. So over time, what you see is this push begun by Rumsfeld but continued under Gates and even Panetta um, of uh, basically going, put, sending soldiers where soldiers didn't normally go, pushing down the normal authority or, or eliminating the traditional um, restrictions on sending soldiers um, to go do spying operations. Um, a lot of it was done in part with competition with the CIA. Rumsfeld didn't want to be reliant on the CIA. Um, but over time, over the last decade, you did see a kind of detente of sorts. Uh, where the CIA and the Pentagon realized they were tripping over each other in these dark spots in American foreign policy, and they did work to sort of carve up the world, for lack of a better term, to send soldiers um, into places where there weren't enough spies and, and have the spies, the CIA, take the lead in countries like Pakistan, putting the soldiers under CIA authority um, to operate in countries like Pakistan. And the, and the most famous example um, of that is in May 2011 when, um, a, when a team of Navy SEALs went into deep into Pakistan, a country where the United States is not at war, and killed Osama bin Laden. And that under that, during that raid, the entire time, it was under CIA authority. So it was this example of this um, sort of very, very clear example of um, the military operating outside of a war zone under CIA authority and really how there had been this, this convergence. Um, I want to just read a little bit because, as I said, it's, um, it's not just a book about uh, it's drones or a book about meetings. It's a book about people. And um, I, I thought I would um, just, just read a little bit about um, uh, one chapter uh, about a CIA officer's experience in Pakistan. Um, I use this chapter, the, the, the officer's name is Art Keller. He only spent a short period of time in Pakistan, but I'd use the chapter, chapter to try to um, sort of explain, after, when I was interviewing him, I realized that there's sort of a day in the life quality of, 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 of something here where, I mean, it was amazing to me, sort of how did a CIA officer in the middle of the tribal areas work? Where, how did he live? Um, how did he spy? Um, and, um, and so I sort of used this chapter to um, uh, sort of explain that. And I'm going to read for a bit, and then I'm going to wrap up and uh, answer some questions. So this is from chapter nine. It's called The Base. It didn't take long for Art Keller to learn what had become the first rule for CIA officers serving in Pakistan. Each day you spend in the country, you know less than you did the day before. By the time your tour of duty is up, you know nothing. By the middle of 2006, when Keller's helicopter touched down in, at a CIA base near Wana, in the tribal agency of South Waziristan, intelligence operations in Pakistan had become the 21st century version of James Jesus Angleton's Wilderness of Mirrors. Angleton, the legendary and ruthless former chief of counterintelligence at the CIA, had paraphrased his beloved T.S. Eliot to describe the deceptions, double crosses, and divided loyalties of Cold War espionage. Decades later, the spy games in Pakistan were no less maddening to play. The boyish-looking Keller was an unlikely candidate to be dropped into the middle of the Pakistani mountains at a time when al-Qaeda was turning the area into a new base of operations. He had never stepped foot in Pakistan before, sp spoke none of the local languages, and his expertise in Iran's missile program was about to do him, was, wasn't about to do him much good in Wana. But with the Iraq war taking CIA case officers with any Middle East experience away from Afghanistan and Pakistan, the clandestine service was desperate for bodies. So Art Keller volunteered for Afghanistan. Instead, he was assigned to Pakistan. Quote, the ideal person you want sitting in that base was someone who could speak Dari or Urdu or Pashtu with years of experience and knows the target, he said. Instead, you got me. The dusty CIA base in South Waziristan, where Keller arrived in 2006, was in the same town that Pakistani troops had hit with artillery and gunships during the battle with Nek Mohammed's fighters in 2004, and near the madrasa in Shakai, where government troops had agreed to a ceasefire with the Waziri tribesmen. When Keller got there, another fragile peace deal was in place. This one had been negotiated by Pakistani troops and Baitullah Massoud, 
another young guerrilla leader who had picked up the bloody ban banner when Nick Mohammed was killed in, two, in a 2004 CIA drone strike. Massoud had never honored the terms of the agreement, and he had merely used the ceasefire to consolidate power in South Waziristan and plan hit and run attacks on Pakistani troops. But Pakistan's military leadership in 2006 did not want another battle in the tribal areas. So when Art Keller arrived there, there was little appetite among Pakistani soldiers and spies to kick a hornet's nest. As a result, relations between CIA officers and the local ISA, ISI operatives in South Waziristan were, were dismal. When he landed in Wana, Keller learned just how bad they were when he was briefed by the man he would be replacing, a salty old officer named Gene. Gene told Keller that Pakistani troops were doing few patrols and spending nearly all of their days inside protected barracks. No matter how hard he pushed, Gene said, the Pakistani military and spies did not want to challenge the power of the mini state that Baitullah Massoud was building in South Waziristan. Uh, it goes on from there to describe sort of how Art Keller uh, sort of spent his days inside this base, where he was as much a prisoner um, to the ISI as he was really a case officer on the ground. He had to do all of his spying by computer. He, um, he ran his sources um, through email exchanges. And I, I sort of use this example to sort of talk about the middle period uh, in the relationship between the CIA and the ISI. A big part of the book is sort of tracking the downward, or the arc, which is really a downward spiral in U.S.-Pakistan relations from uh, post 9-11, which where they weren't particularly terrific relations, but um, they were cooperative and there was some degree of trust down through 2011, 2012, where um, they, and to really where they are today, which is um, fractured relations uh, and um, a, a great deal of mistrust. And uh, I use the CIA ISI relationship to sort of describe um, the sort of broader relationship in a microcosm, where the spies who didn't always trust each other at first worked with each other, and then during this Art Keller period, there was mistrust, but they still allowed CIA officers on bases in the tribal areas, to the point of today, where after the infamous Raymond Davis episode in early 2011, after the bin Laden raid, um, and a few other events, um, you basically had this intense mistrust between the ISI, ISI and the CIA. And it's really one of the, one of the, the consequences of the secret wars is its impact on relationships. And, um, and it, it is something that I think will, will continue for some time. And when you look at U.S. Pakistan's, the relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan, um, it is dysfunctional, it is, um, it is tortured, and yet is, it is endlessly fascinating, in part because um, if you look throughout history, um, or at least Pakistan's still very young history, uh, you'll see the United States and Pakistan are thrown together at certain times because the world, uh, world events conspire um, for it to happen that way, and after intense um, uh, period of, of being in this embrace, they usually get sick of each other and then go to their own quarters. So I think we're kind of in this period right now where uh, we're, 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 we're maybe going to our own quarters uh, and um, until possibly we see something else down the road that will throw us together again. So I'm gonna uh, stop here and, um, uh, and take questions. Like, you want to go first? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is, we've all heard of blowback. It's a term, I guess, uh, where our actions overseas come back and um, we have terrorist attacks here at home. Does uh, CIA care about the blowback? If yes, why do they continue with the programs that they have? The I wouldn't call it targeted, targeted killing. It, it seems like more shotgun killing, where they try to kill one person. At the same time, they end up killing a whole bunch of innocent civilians. And if no, why don't they care about the blowback? Thank you. I, I, I think there is concern. I think there is definitely um, analysis going on on the impact of drone strikes, impact of these, these secret wars. Uh, the extent of the analysis, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a sort of interesting... Uh, I mean, the way the CIA is set up, you have analysis and you have operations. And um, oftentimes the analysts, or usually the analysts, are forced into the position of, of, of grading the operations. Um, if they're doing their job, they are, right? And so you're grading, the CIA is grading its own work in some ways. And there's, there was concern that, that because of that, um, there wasn't enough analysis going into the blowback. But I think there, there certainly is that work going on. And, and I think we're just at the beginning of... Um, uh, maybe just <coughs> understanding what that is. And, and, and it won't be some time, I think, before we really know 
whether the intensity of drone operations in the drone campaign is, um, as Rumsfeld famously put it, you know, creating more terrorists than they're killing. Um, that's a, it's a good question that's still, still relevant today. Um, and, you know, whether it spawns, I mean, there, there's anecdotal evidence of, um, you know, for instance, in 2010, in May, when um, uh, Faisal Shahzad uh, tried to blow up Times Square with a bomb, uh, he was thankfully unsuccessful, but he, um, he went into court and he said, you know, the reason why I did this was because of the drone campaign in Pakistan. Um, you know, it's still unclear what inspired the two men and two brothers in Boston recently to carry <clears throat> out their uh, attack. And, you know, it, it won't be known maybe for some time, um, uh, but it's, um, it is actually a question that, that the CIA and other intelligence anal agencies <clears throat> are asking is, um, you know, what is, what, what's better? What, I mean, it, 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 do you feel safer that these guys were not affiliated with an international terrorist group or that they were, right? And so it doesn't appear that they were necessarily, so sent by Al Qaeda or sent by an Al Qaeda affiliate, they were acting on their own. They were inspired on their own largely, it seems that way. So is that, that's maybe even a scarier pro proposition, that there's more like this coming um, for whatever reason. And so as the Obama administration, which um, certainly, um, as I say in the book and have talked about publicly, certainly has um, embraced and many ways expanded these kind of secret wars, um, they are going to have to sort of right at this point in the second term say, you know, what is the impact um, and, um, and what is the blowback? Um, and is, just this, is this just the beginning of the blowback? Hi, uh, John Hauge. Uh, we, in my book club, chose this book uh, last week, and so we were very happy to find all of a sudden that uh, that you're here. And so I read it, and it's uh, extremely good. I recommend it to everybody. But let me ask you: put yourself in the position of as head of the ISI, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, you know, India is supposed to be your top focus. You want to keep good relations with the Akani network and the Taliban because you want Pakistan to be a player in Afghanistan. You know, the U.S. is going to leave Afghanistan but not really because they have the remote strike capability. You want to take the American dollars, you want to use them for surgical strikes, but not hit civilians. How do you balance those competing demands? Well, and it's a great, that's a terrific question. Um, and I, um, I, one of the reasons I've traveled to Pakistan and I did for this book is to get as much of the perspective of Pakistan as possible. I mean, it's very um, easy to caricature Pakistan in, in Washington or because it seems like just this frustrating relationship. But um, as you said, so, so if you look at this from Pakistan's perspective, you've had, um, uh, you have a, a, a country entirely geared towards India uh, that is, um, they are the threat and they are still the number one threat in Pakistan. There's no question that even after, you know, this push by the U.S. to to reorient um, their, their sort of view of the region, uh, billions and billions of dollars to, to support counterterrorism <clears throat> operations in the tribal areas, um, uh, the, uh, and an increasing amount of terrorist attacks inside Pakistan by groups that sometimes <clears throat> used to be, uh, get the patronage of the ISI. Even after that, India is still the threat. Um, and so the question is, how do, you, how do you balance all of this? I think that, um, it's sometimes very deftly done and sometimes sort of very ham-handed. I mean, there's no question that, that, that Pakistan has, <clears throat> has tried at least to maintain some ties, communications, um, some kind of relationship with groups like the Haqqani Network, with groups like the Afghan Taliban. Some of it, some of those relationships the U.S. is relying on now in order to broker peace negotiations in Afghanistan. Um, is, I think when people say all, all Pakistan wants is a, is, a, is a takeover of the Taliban in Afghanistan, I don't think that's, that's the case. I think Pakistan wants some degree of stability in Afghanistan with uh, the Taliban or elements of the Taliban playing some role. They do not want, uh, they most fear, um, a government that is under India's sphere of influence in Kabul. Uh, and a lot of concern has been that, that Karzai and elements of Karzai's government are uh, basically um, under New Delhi's influence. Um, so, I, I, so you continue to, uh, to, to, to keep relationships with these groups. Um, you continue to allow drone strikes uh, against groups that are more your enemies. Um, some of the drone strikes in Pakistan are not just American enemies, they're very much Pakistan's enemies. Um, it's, it's a very complicated 
confusing, dangerous game that Pakistan has played and will continue to play. And, you know, from their perspective, they have to play because they are going to be, this is their neighborhood and we're getting out. And um, so, I mean, I, I, I try to sort of flesh out some of these different dynamics and not just sort of say, uh, clearly Pakistan was playing this double game the whole time and it's cut and dry because and they're, they're, they've been with the militants all along. It's not, it's not that, that way. And there are real repercussions of when the CIA started doing more unilateral operations in Pakistan, the ISI started um, sort of getting us, they started thinking more and more the U.S. and India were doing these operations. Mm -hmm. And so the, the paranoia and the conspiracy theories in Pakistan sort of increased. And that's hard because they're already really, really <laughs> strong in Pakistan. That, that basically attempt to answer your question? It's, well, yeah, yeah. It, it was, but, but the reason I asked it is it, to try to get a greater understanding as people read through the book of the pressures the ISI leadership is also under. I mean, it, yeah. it isn't just the, the U.S. perception and why can't they be more accommodating to what we want. They have pressures of their own that at sometimes are even more important to them in terms of India, in terms of a future of Afghanistan, than the relationship with the U.S. The the um, absolutely right, and that I mean in Pakistan, the the, the most important institution is the military. Um, the ISI is part of the military, and um, the pressure to um, to sort of maintain Pakistani security, to maintain the 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 image of the military, um, the, the is also a source of pressure for the ISI, and um, so. You know, it's it, it, as Pakistan tries to continue to have a democratic, democratically elected civilian government, as weak as it as it may, may be, um, the ISI and the military still very much are, are sort of holding the strings. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm curious. Do you believe that the CIA has a racial deficit, and by that I mean uh, too many white American case officers who locals are hesitant to talk to, and if so, do you believe that they're giving it the attention it deserves to remedy the problem. Um, it's hard to know. I mean, it, it's impo it's impossible to know real you know percentages of of ethnic you know background of CIA undercover case officers. I do know that there was this feeling like on on 9/11 that that the CIA was still um, uh, made oriented towards the Cold War, which meant you know sending white case officers to embassies overseas and out you know, of Yale, out of Yale um, and you know spying in cocktail parties right and so um, and that there was this push that we needed more people uh, you know Tennant did this and and Hayden and Goss I mean they all did this to push um, you know get more CIA officers who you know could speak local languages and um, and blend in more it takes a long time and um, and as, as I said, and I, the passage I wrote, you also had this, this um, I mean, two things. You had the wars. You had Iraq and Afghanistan being this sort of big pull for the CIA to set up these giant stations overseas where a lot of the newer officers got sucked into these giant stations. And there were fewer to go to places like Pakistan elsewhere to do that kind of spying. A lot of it was the concern in the CIA was that they were just supporting the military operations in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. Um, but, I mean, so I think that it's, it's one of these things that probably takes a generation. And, um, and, and the other problem has been traditionally that um, there had been restrictions on getting, in, getting these people into the agency or anyone with, getting anyone with a Pakistani background. They're or not American. Well, they're not full American because of, of clearance issues, the questions of, of um, their family members overseas. There were, the, there were these big concerns that, you know, people counterintelligence concerns about getting penetrated. So I think some of those restrictions have, have eased and to get some more people in. But that was one of the things that was holding this up. Thank you. Sure. I, um, I'd like to first congratulate you for the work you've done and journalists like you, because it's my feeling that without that, this country would really be going off the deep end in many, many ways. Thank you. But in saying that, I think there's a danger element that I'm very curious about in terms of your safety. Uh, a journalist by the name of Danny Pearl, okay, um, that was a very sad, tragic event. But you're dealing in some very, very secret areas where there are a lot of people that might not like you being there. And I just wonder what you think about doing that, your own safety, and the concern of those you know, who, who are near and dear to you. Well, the, um, 
Lissa, in the in her introduction, sort of said that I I'd done a lot of, of traveling overseas, and I ha I have done some, but I I sort of in comparison to some of my colleagues who. I consider far braver than I am, um, who have spent weeks and months in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. Um, uh, they are, um, you know, they are in constant fear for their safety. I think that, but that's not saying that anytime you go, you, you go overseas, you don't uh, experience some risk. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a question of the more you do it, you do better understand how, um, where to go, who to talk to, who not to talk to. Um, you rely on people who know the country well. Uh, when I was in F when I was in Pakistan this last time, I stayed with my colleague Dex Declan Walsh, who was uh, the Islamabad bureau chief of the Times, who's been in Pakistan about seven eight years, and nobody knows the country better. Um, and so he would help me with a driver. He would help me um, sort of advise me on where to go, and and and. Um, it's, uh, that's not to say, I mean, anything can happen, certainly. And um, it's taking calculated risks. It's taking um, risks that you think are worth it. I think, you know, my, one, another former colleague of mine, David Rode, who was, ended up being kidnapped for a significant period of time by the Taliban, uh, was working on a book. And he was in Afghanistan. And he decided to do an interview. And he thought it was a, a calculated risk. He thought it was the risk worth taking. And, he went to the wrong place, and he was he was captured. Thankfully, he, he escaped. Um, and if you asked him, he would say, you know, I didn't need that interview. <laughs> um, and um, that's you know, it's 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 what it's the type of sort of dis, um, decisions that reporters who cover this make every day. And thankfully, there are um, there the the cases of people being taken into harm or captured or killed are, are still relatively low, low, knock on wood, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a constant up. question. Do, do you keep a diary of the people you speak to and where you're going and, and, and such so that there's a record of that? Um, I certainly, like for instance, when I was in Pakistan, um, uh, would know, you know, dec the people in the, in the Islamabad Bureau knew where I was going, who I was talking to, and, and I talked to them about, you know, what interviews I'd set up. I got a yep. question. What do you call a secret army? I, my understanding, the uh, the CIA when it operates, it operates in giant places mm -hmm. overseas. Usually, each embassy you have a chief of station, and it has a number of people. And then when they have an operation, along with the army or the armed forces, they work out of a fob, which means forward operation base. Mm -hmm. But you make a statement they had like a giant places, you know, like in Afghanistan or in Iraq. And I don't think that's a true fact. So the what, what the point I was making earlier was that the stations in um, in Baghdad and Kabul were large, um, and they weren't filled necessarily with all paramilitary officers. They were analysts and case officers to do the work of, in many ways, sort of um, the the work of supporting the military operations in in those countries. The the reference to the secret army in the in the subtitle of the book is actually more about. Um, to some extent what the CIA does, but also um, the, the rise of special operations troops in uh, the, uh, the, the American military mission and the convergence of the CIA and the secret army. So Joint Special Operations Command, like the Delta Force and the Navy SEALs, a lot of the book talks about their rise. And so the secret army in many ways is, is the work of the, of the special operations troops and the CIA converging and, um, and, and around this whole idea of manhunting. Okay, because to me, an army is usually people in uniform, and my understanding is the CIA, when it works overseas, they work with the soft teams. That's right, and a teams. lot of times they're not in uniform. A lot, right. And, and so, right, the, the, the idea, of, so the, the, the image of the secret army is, is a military force, but one that it doesn't necessarily look like the 1st Marine Division or something like that. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Brad Keller. And uh, my question is about the CIA. You said earlier that, uh, after, like after the Church Commission, there was a pullback in what the CIA's scope was. Uh, and I'm not really asking you to predict the future, but what parts of what they're doing now seem like things that are going to survive and last, and that's how the CIA is going to work, and what seem unsustainable and once we kind of get out of this post-9-11, you know, whatever you would call it, that it's probably going to go away. Can you and maybe you address it in the book? I I, read the book well, yet. no. I mean, I, I think we're at this point now where there's only now just public discussion about some of this. Um, it was striking to me that 
and when I was when I was writing the book last you know last year, uh, it was not at all an issue of the campaign, right? Because both Obama and, and Romney basically agreed on it. So. Um, uh, so I, I was sort of toiling away wondering, is anyone going to care about this? And it's only in the last couple of months that you've seen more congressional scrutiny and public statements by President Obama and um, the new CIA director, John Brennan, that, um, that, that maybe, uh, that first of all, there needs to be tr more transparency to this, but second of all, in Brennan's case, saying, you know, maybe the CIA needs to be getting back more to traditional spying and less, have, a, have less of a paramilitary focus. Brennan, um, you know, it will be interesting to see what happens. Um, uh, they are, I, I do think some of this will um, migrate to the Pentagon, uh, but I don't, I do not see any time soon the CIA giving up its uh, aspects of the drone program, the lethal authority to carry out strikes, at least in Pakistan. Um, I think presidents w always want the CIA to uh, have this uh, authority because it gives the president another option. So. Um, I think that there, you might see the CIA dialing back some of what it has been doing in the sort of paramilitary lethal, lethal action, but I don't think it's going to go away. And um, I think one question is if there really is this try to refocus what the agency is doing after you know, 12 years of war, um, how long that takes and how long you have you know, officers who are trained in this manhunting mission um, almost have to get retrained in the more traditional work, because it does. I mean, you ask people who are in the CIA, um, it takes a long time. Um, the work that was done in the Cold War is different than the work that's done now. And so, um, um, you know, it may take another generation, but it'll be, um, I do think that, that there's recognition that, that some of this needs to stop or at least go to the military or at least be, di at least be dialed back from the CIA's point of view. And I, I would think that um, as more people learn about it, there might be public pressure. There might be a new church commission type situation that forces the CIA to make these decisions more quickly or differently than they would have on their own, perhaps? Yeah, it, it's a good question about whether you would see a congressional, um, I, I mean, it, what, what, what has been striking is that, um, I mean, if you're just looking at the, the targeted killing operations or whoever you want to call them, um, the, there, there still has been this bipartisan support for it, um, both Democrats and Republicans. And for maybe some of it is, is for political reasons, some of it is for reasons where um, the feeling is that, um, that, you know, drone strikes we can live with, whereas interrogation we couldn't. Um, I'm talking about within Congress. Um, but I'm still also struck by how much um, Congress doesn't uh, try to get to the bottom of things. Um, or, um, you know, w a legacy of the Church Committee is, um, is the Congressional Intelligence Committees, this House and the Senate. And when uh, I was covering the Brennan hearing a couple months ago, you had um, the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is about a dozen members, who are the only ones who are allowed to have this intelligence, this access to the highest levels of classification. They didn't even have the legal memos that were justifying the underpinnings of the targeted killing program. So they don't have them. I mean, how are they supposed to really perform proper oversight? And the only time they can sometimes in times of war, the legislative branch can only have any authority or leverage is when they're holding up a nominee, and that's what they basically tried to do with Brennan. Uh, but um, so, uh, you know, I think that I, I do think that the, the intelligence committees could do a better job. I think that they could they could do uh, a more thorough job, and I think it needs to also get beyond the intelligence committees where there's discussion, not in a closed chamber about. I mean, I understand the need for these secret meetings and talk about classifi classified um, programs, but. I mean, the drone program is hardly a secret anymore, and so it's time for, I think, a little more transparency. Thanks. Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, very good book, by the way. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. for. I wanted to ask you just on, um, more generally, about your perception of the overall morale uh, in the CIA these days, because this is my perception. I'm sure it's uh, many other people's perception that the CIA has been scapegoated an awful lot for... Um, quote, discovering ma weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. whereas when reading newspapers at, at the time, it was pretty clear that there were many agents who didn't uh, feel that there was, quote, as Tennant said, a slam dunk in this whole process. So my, uh, and uh, you often, you, know, you hear it all the time from various groups that, oh, well, you know, we, we just followed the intelligence. And I'm, I'm wondering to myself, obviously um, CIA is, uh, they want to be professional, so they don't want to uh, to um, speak out um, about what they feel. But I was wondering if 
based on your perception, what, how would professionals feel about that? I, I think you're right about about this the scapegoating. I mean, it. Oh, there's like a there's a term in the military where there's only two kinds of outcomes. There's operational successes and intelligence failures. And basically, if there's a screw up, it's always the intelligence fault, fault right? Yeah. And so, to some degree, um, you know, this the the, the agency. Um, you know, I think one one thing that I think in my book and other books have made clear is that the agency at this point is um, risk uh, uh, conservative in the sense that um, they rely on orders from the White House. They rely on lawyers telling them what they can and can't do. Um, usually, it's presidents, or almost always, it's presidents sending the CIA to do things, right? And um, so, to the extent that there is um, excesses or abuses, um, I mean, usually it comes from the, the top. Um, I mean, I, I, I do think that, I mean, in terms of morale, it's always a hard thing to, to really know. You, you hear things from people, um, you know, you have to sort of figure out who's got agendas and telling you things. I mean, I think that, that, there's, that I mean, if you look at the Obama administration, the CIA has been um, very much at the center of what the United States does. And generally, the agency um, takes, uh, takes pride in being at the center of what the United States does, for good or for bad. But, but the, the sense of being at the center of the mission, you know, you had the Osama bin Laden raid. There was a lot of, of, um, uh, uh, of people cheering what the agency did in its intelligence work leading up to that. Um, so I think being at the center of this mission and manhunting, I think, you know, may, maybe give us, gives a sense of purpose as opposed to if you look at the morale maybe during the 90s, and I wasn't covering this then, but, you know, this cold war had ended, a lot of the people were saying, um, you know, do we even need the CIA? So this is a mission. Now, the question is, again, balancing people's morale versus whether this is the proper mission mm. and whether, um, you know, whether, whether this counterterrorism mission uh, and its cost and opportunity costs are the best for what you know the, an espionage service should be doing. So I, I mean, it's it's I, 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 my sense is that morale is 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 pretty good, um, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a hard thing to say. But it's also um, you know a question of whether that's that's how much you should you know how much that should be primary concern is is the morale of any individual yeah, U.S. government department. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Mary Louise Kelly. Hello. Nice to see you. I'm halfway through and very much enjoying it. Um, I wanted to ask, there's been a, a handful, a very small handful, but a few critics who have alleged that you went easy on some current officials in the mm -hmm. book, John Brennan, for example. And I wanted to give you the chance to respond to that and, you know, address, did you give anybody a pass in the book? And broadly speaking, as part of your answer, I wonder if you'd give us a little bit of insight into what your strategy is for how you do go about covering current officials who you want to obviously have the ability to report on critically, but who you're going to have to have an ongoing relationship with. You need them to return your calls. Yeah. I, I don't know. I actually hadn't seen the, 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 the idea that um, I was easy on Brennan. I mean, uh, I, I didn't interview him uh, 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 for the book. Um, uh, I, I, I sort of went very deep into um, the idea, uh, basically the, the, the war in Yemen as a, um, a really, as the Obama administration's war, and um, how Brennan played this very central role in sort of running this war out of the White House, um, in part because of his um, deep ties to the Saudis and also uh, because of, um, you know, he, he, had, he had sort of this sense that he had a history in Yemen and he, he, he knew the territory. But um, I think that actually was fairly critical of uh, especially the early first year of the war in Yemen where it was this, I think I sort of described how sort of half-baked the whole thing was, where there were these series of American strikes in Yemen um, that, uh, you know, killed far more civilians than, uh, than anyone who was believed to be a militant. Um, and, um, and, I, and I think that, I mean, in the Obama administration, um, I mean, it was striking to me as a reporter and as a reporter as well that um, how much this has really been uh, embraced, that, uh, that the default way we now do business in Pakistan or, or is, is through these secret wars. And I think I sort of raise a lot of very critical questions of how, um, uh, you know, as much as, as the, the Bush administration was criticized for the big, costly, messy wars of occupation uh, that, we've, that we found, have found ourselves in, um, it is the seductive quality of these secret wars that Obama administration really has embraced that is almost as problematic. And so, um, 
you know, I think now that Brennan is at the CIA, I mean, it'll be interesting. I mean, there's been no one who is more central to the targeted killing program over the last four years from the White House. And I think one thing I raise is you have someone who's unappo he's appointed, he's not congressionally approved, in the White House running this, running this war and taking out a lot of power. Now that he has been approved by Congress, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what that'll what that will mean and sorry the second part was Just your... the, the big picture of yeah. the, that challenge of balancing how you do report critically on people who you need to call you back the next time. um you know i i i i knew that i i knew that that that, that the book would basically be um would make a lot of people mad i i, I knew that the that um that it would i i was I, I hope it's fair but i also think it's it's um it tries to ask tough questions and um, you know, inevitably, as you know, reporting that you will write things, um, whether they stories or books, that will uh, anger people, and 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 that person will no longer return your calls. Uh, it's sort of the cost of doing business, and um, you know, sometimes they will stop returning your calls for a period of time, and then their anger will pass. I think the bigger challenge right now is that there is just it's incredibly difficult to report in this world because of the sort of crackdown on information, um, leak investigations, people are going to jail for talking to reporters. It's, um, it's, that's one of the things that I found. It was sort of going on as I worked on the book and since I've been back at the paper that, you know, people I've spoken to in the past say, you know, don't contact me. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a really big challenge. And whether or not any, any of these leak investigations go anywhere or they all collapse, they're having the intended effect of scaring other people. Uh, if we could go back for a second to the issue or the question of personal safety and personal risk, mm. did you ever feel threatened at any time in pursuing uh, this uh, the book? Uh, and and had, uh, did you do anything that you would consider kind of crazy that uh, was a little beyond uh, what you normally would do? Um, I, in terms of actual reporting of the book, I think it was I was pretty cautious. I mean, my 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 travels around Afghanistan and Pakistan on this trip were mostly around the capital and elsewhere and uh, I don't think I was taking any any crazy risks. I mean sometimes you don't know you don't know what you don't know and you don't know you know when your risks are are crazy uh, uh, but um, I mean there's uh, and previous reporting trips to Pakistan have gone to sort of the edge of the tribal areas to Peshawar and, and, and around and I mean you, de you definitely get a feeling of um, you're being watched or that you're very, you stick out. And I was not by myself. I was with a couple of New York Times colleagues. And again, they know the lay of the land and they know more about when to go and where to go and who to see. But, um, you know, you don't stay in any one place for a particularly long period of time. You don't, I mean, if you're in Peshawar, you know, you're probably, someone's probably trying to track what you're doing. But you're very conscious. I mean, if you're in Pakistan, you're in the capital, there is still, uh, I, I've actually found in this past trip, um, Islamabad compared to a couple years ago felt much more actually of a safer city. Um, uh, I remember a few years ago I was going and the, the, the constant military checkpoints it sort of felt like a, a city under siege. And this last time felt much more like um, you, you know, there was a, there, it was calmer. There, the more restaurants were open. People were sitting outside eating dinner, and and um, so uh, again, it's just a question of um, of you know, you probably know in your head. Everyone has their own sort of their own uh, gauge in their head about what what risk is is too great. And uh, as I said, I think compared to some of my colleagues, I probably. Um, I'm, I'm 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 a lot I'm a lot less brave than than some of them. Thank you all very much and thank you. Thank you.